Great. All right, here we are. So again, this first part will be recorded. And then when I move into a space of community sharing, then I'll end the recording. The meditation that we came into is a practice in learning the intersection, the oneness, the sameness between relaxation and trust. And this is something that I've been thinking so much about. I've been thinking a lot about the different places in my life that arise where I go into tension, be it kind of dwelling on the past or worrying about the future or going into reaction or defense or strategy. We all have those hooks, those different moments where we don't know our, our whole system doesn't believe or yet understand the safety that's in front of us. And so we do tense up a natural response to not feeling safe, to not feeling secure about what's arising is actually to tense up. What's so interesting about tension is it creates that which we think we're protecting ourselves from. And it's almost the antithetical movement to go into relaxation when we're feeling threatened. It's almost like our whole conditioned mind everything we've come to know about what's safe and what isn't safe tells us don't relax. And there's an ongoing learning for us on this journey of meeting those very places where we don't believe relaxation is possible. And relaxation here is not an expression of being passive or any idea of not doing but to be relaxed, to be peaceful. And this is a part of the journey where we're all learning how to center ourselves in a state of being that is less and less conditioned or determined by the environment. And this has so much to do with the conditions that we place in our life. These are the things that we need to feel safe. This is how I need to be treated. These are the things that need to be in my life. This is what I have to have first. This is one of the most um, basic levels of consciousness within Taurus, unrefined, where the, the more base survival instinct, if it's just about survive, if it's just about life and feeling alive, sustaining our human existence, there's an instinctual gravitation towards whatever feels good and away from whatever doesn't feel good, which translates into, I'm going to live here. I'm not going to die. That's the most basic, and we're not consciously thinking of that, but the most basic level of consciousness within Taurus is really about the survival of the species. And the fact that we have a certain human biology that um, means you're programmed to want to be here. Like we're all programmed to want to be here because from the Scorpio perspective, if you think of the polarity of Taurus, which is Scorpio, which is all about evolution, we can say this life journey is actually much more about death than anything else. It's about letting go. It's about facing our psychological limitations, facing our facing all the ways in which we're seeking to know ourselves and hold on to something that we believe determines our own sense of ultimate security. And so that feels quite difficult. <laughs> so it's an interesting, from, from the soul perspective, this is one poetic fun way of thinking of Taurus. It's not the only way of thinking of Taurus. We can say that Taurus is the way that the soul has programmed a human experience so that it wants to be here. So we're all wired to be attuned to via the senses. Am I going to survive? Am I safe? Am I comfortable? Do I have what I need? The basic food, water, shelter, but then on a deeper level, do I feel secure in this moment? Am I worried about the future? Am I going to get that which I need, that which I've determined as necessary for a life that's livable? And so if we're operating on a purely survival level, all the places <clears throat> where we perceive unsafety, all the places in particular where we say life isn't here, 
I'm not going to have what I need. And thus, life will mean um, not enjoying myself, not feeling in my body, not feeling good. The quality of self-value and self-esteem and self-worth come with Taurus because it reflects the ability to receive what we need and to even know and to determine that which we need and to know how to manifest that in our own lives, to be in relationship to the totality of our human lives. And if we're lacking that self-value and that self-esteem, then we'll deny those things. We won't really appreciate the potential for life to be peaceful and joyful and gratifying. And so wherever our sense of self-value, our sense of self-esteem linked to what we've identified as necessary for our life is threatened, is where the anxiety and the fear and the worry comes up. And from a Taurus perspective, that's like literally the opposite of living. Right, the opposite of living, the opposite of life, the opposite of not even survival, but like receiving life is a state of stress and anxiety. When we're in a state of stress and anxiety, not just physiologically, we're using up our own chi, we're using up our life force, we're just not in the moment. It's like I, I heard this teaching from Adya Shanti once. <clears throat> he was speaking about you can be on a beach. A uh, beautiful sunrise, amazing breeze, ocean, and you can be in your head the whole time. You can be thinking about the stock market or how you're going to pay rent. The mind can be in all these basic human concerns and completely miss the prana, the chi, the life force that's actually here now. And when we go deeper, as we all learn on our spiritual journey, a part of what I think we all um, begin to realize in our own way is that there's an immense amount of life force in this moment. Something that I keep on finding when I come back to the practice, when I come back to almost like applying the, the, the principles, the teachings that everyone's been saying for thousands of years, there's that direct experience that we have on our, in our own way, a direct experience of realizing how invigorating, um, how healing and regenerative the moment is. And so our anxiety thus becomes a way of unconsciously depriving ourselves of life, which is a head trip, because we think we want life, we think we want to live, we think we want to enjoy ourselves, we think we want to um, be happy and be content and be fulfilled. But it's like a very interesting way of actually not giving that to ourselves. When we become aware of what we are creating, the reality that we're actually creating, via our vibration, where we're directing our thoughts. One, I think we all become more and more self-responsible for what we're thinking, what we're, how we're orienting ourselves to the moment. We realize it actually is in our hands. More and more we realize there's not something outside creating a stressful life for us. This is not something I would actually ever tell someone because that's not my place to sell, right? Because we all have our own struggles. We all have our own curriculum. It's my work to do my work. Um, and yet these are things that I find to be universal, that we're all realizing this on the journey. When we settle into a place of relaxation, there is an implicit trust in that. And I think it's really interesting to just consider the relationship between relaxation and trust and awareness. To be relaxed, in particular in the face of discomfort, is one to say, I'm not going to run towards the most instinctual base unconscious impulse to um, move towards pleasure or away from pain. I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> to be relaxed doesn't qualify the state of our sensational experience by any means at all. We can be in, in some sort of uncomfortable moment or a pleasurable moment. Actually, I find that anxiety can be, can be easily offered up in any sensational experience. We can be in pleasure and experience anxiety. Like we can meet otherwise good feeling sensations with anxiety. And that's kind of like putting your hand in the bowl and putting more in your mouth or reaching for more sensation. We can bring anxiety into discomfort, which is that state of tension and resistance. Um, I've never given birth, but I understand the metaphor of birth, but I can speak times where I've sat in medicine ceremony where oftentimes you might get well, you might release, right? Or just when I've been sick 
and I feel that my body is wanting to release something. I might be nauseous or nauseated. I've always found that the very most helpful thing to do is to actually sit upright and relax. And oftentimes, the more I relax, the more uncomfortable the sensation. And so again, for the conditioned mind, this is totally paradoxical and is, is like, don't do that. Like, this is like, why would you do that? <laughs> and yet, um, from a place of awareness, from a place of trust, that relaxation actually says, my suffering isn't in the sensation. My suffering is in my relationship to this moment. It's a profound thing to practice. Um, I go in and out of stress and overwhelm. And yet that teaching is always there for me. The teaching is always um, there to be learned again and again and again. And I'm so grateful for the, the, the 10,000 ways in which this teaching has been offered by many, many people in different ways over many, many, many years. Those who have been living way, way before any of us. I think sometimes the deepest teachings, the most profound instructions are the simplest pointers um, and the ones that we resist most. And Taurus is simple. If we really want to understand like the peacefulness, the simplicity, the beauty that's, that's held within the Taurus archetype, it's to really understand that the path living is about grace and beauty. A deeper dimension of Taurus isn't just survival and getting what we need. Because if we really think about this being a soul journey, then there's a way of embodying experience. There's a way of embodying the present moment that is in a state of allowing and trust that says, whatever is coming here, I'm going to allow that because I trust this present moment. And so grace becomes the deeper teaching of Taurus. In fact, the highest expression of living beyond the, the attributes of survival is grace, beauty. And grace and beauty, not in some sort of form or construct or appearance, grace and beauty as a state of being. Grace, this is how we are in relation to like sit upright in discomfort or to feel the 10,000 things that we don't want to feel. Right? To be faced with the 10,000 experiences we don't want to have. And to choose grace in that moment, even if we don't have an answer. We don't know the solution. We don't necessarily know the way through, the way out, the way out of suffering. But the other alternative is to try to control. And I think we get to a point where we just kind of start to understand it doesn't, doesn't help. It doesn't, doesn't get us what we want. As justified as we are, right? And we all have our own mechanisms of control. Like the, the, from the Taurus, and we can look at Venus in our own charts as well to kind of elaborate a little bit more on this because Venus is really in some way going to point to and speak to how we identify our needs and our values and you know what makes life livable and also how we are in relationship to our body and a sense of pleasure and enjoyment it's relational socially it's also physical and aesthetic and so we all have our own ways of either grasping at or avoiding relative to our taurus venus function and for all of us these are deeply ingrained survival patterns we have to appreciate that they're deeply ingrained survival patterns. Very few, not just humans, right? Like, or we can say like most species on, on the planet, as far as I'm aware, and I could be wrong, maybe don't necessarily have that level of self-awareness to, to go beyond just, you know, I got to make sure I'm surviving. And I could be wrong about that because I don't know enough about all the species. So forgive me if I'm not seeing that clearly, but even to be a human, and to have that awareness itself is kind of rare. To come to that point, even if just for a moment, and then we forget it for a few years, to come to that point where we realize we're actually not going to find true fulfillment. Um, we won't find the joy and the satisfaction we're looking for in our grasping for or avoiding of. 
So the trust says, I understand that I don't know enough. There's a teaching in A Course in Miracles that says, I am not upset for the reasons that I think. There's another teaching that says, um, and maybe if Michelle, you're here, you can write in the comments what the actual phrasing is, if you remember. Everything is created by the one that knows what's best. Like, if you knew that every experience in your life um, was offered for the highest purposes, which could be a hard pill to swallow, but imagine applying that idea first and then applying it to whatever the situation is. So we don't have to understand it or know it or um, know where it's going. For me, why that teaching is so profound is that it actually gives permission to hold a stance of peace. And that alone, the fact that I can choose that itself is profound. And I want to emphasize what I'm expressing here. Oftentimes, we're just looking for the appropriate perspective or belief system or instruction or permission for us to take the stance that allows us to be at peace. We, we need someone to tell us, you can trust this now, or there's a reason, there's a purpose, or it's going somewhere, or allow it. It's revealing something that you need to go through. It's a part of the journey. Bring grace, bring, bring trust, bring permission there. And, and maybe if someone wise enough or some older book or some dream message can tell us this, then we can settle and allow our life to be exactly what it is. To not try to change a thing, to not try to resist a thing, to not try to grab at a thing. And just to even recognize intellectually <coughs> That if we had that permission, if we had that belief system, then we would actually be able to apply it and give trust to the present moment. Just recognizing that we are able to do that, to me, is quite profound. Because that means, oh... If I'm waiting to believe that now is okay and that it's actually safe and actually spiritually conducive to hold a state of grace and trust and allowing, and that in that belief I'm actually able to trust it, we are capable of offering a vibration that we believe we are capable of offering. And then just recognizing that, well, hmm, if all I need is to believe it in order to do it, to see that I could do it, that is enough for me to know that I could do it. Maybe I should try it. And that's kind of where we are turning that corner in going deeper into an understanding, going deeper into our trust, going deeper into our faith, going deeper into our allowing. And of all the people that I've met my entire life, the happiest people, the most peaceful people that I've come to witness aren't the people that don't have challenges arise in their life, but are the people that are practiced in living gracefully. They're practicing and offering a vibration of allowance and trust and softness. Now, let's come back to the idea that the deeper dimension, the deeper expression of Taurus is grace. Something for me <coughs> that keeps on blossoming on my own soul journey is song. I imagine this is probably different for everyone in a different way. And that song may not be the same for everyone. And that there might be other expressions of embodiment. In fact, I think they're all kind of the same. Like song, movement, dance. Like they're all the same. And we all have our own way of being with them. And maybe our own we're, own, we're wired to be in relationship to form in such ways. I keep on learning and finding for myself that um, song is this ever-present um, I don't even know what to call it. I don't want to call it a tool because that, um, that commodifies the poetry and the beauty and the, the mystery of it as well. Um, so song is itself. Almost like song points to itself. Song points to the moment. Um, a song that came through me once, which I'll sing in a moment. Um, 
the, the, the song points to itself as the point of the song. In the Hare Krishna movement, I, I remember hearing very often that it's been taught that um, you chant for the purpose of chanting. It's like you're immersing, you're immersing yourself in the holy name. You're immersing yourself in the vibration of the holy, of the sacred. And I keep on learning that there's something about song and just being in a state of grace, coming into an embodied relationship to grace that doesn't require me to get beyond stress and anxiety and worry. Um, it doesn't suppress it, but it's not, it doesn't, it's not compatible with stress and anxiety and worry. I can bring my stress and anxiety and worthy to it. Like grace says yes to that. It leans in upright and open and soft and, and trusting and caring. Everything can be brought to song and maybe in the same way, everything can be brought to God. Um, Venus is the ruler of Taurus and the higher octave of Venus is Neptune. And we could always understand some of the deeper teachings when we look at octaves. Venus is embodiment, right? Our body, our sensuality, how we're surviving, how we're relating to our physical, social, human relational life. Um, but it's very much lateral, right? It's, um, you know, me in relationship to body, to form, to things, to people. What are the agreements? What are the specific ways of dancing with this particular moment or this particular person? It's very in the world. But the higher teaching of all things is Neptune. The higher teachings of all things is one. Everything's reflecting ourselves. Everything is pointing us back to ourselves. And everything is the same. The higher teaching of every experience is forgiveness. The deeper lesson in all experiences is the, the remembering of what we are and the forgiving of the mistakes in our mind. All of these are um, what's learned in Neptune. And if we don't stay on a purely growth level of experience where it's like, here are my human needs, my physical needs, my relational needs, we understand the deeper meaning of life. And that's how we can understand the relationship between Venus and Neptune. So we don't commodify anything. We don't commodify our relationships. I need you to make me feel a certain way for me to trust this moment. How often do we get stressed out and anxious about the state of our relationships or the state of our finances? For me to live in peace and trust of this moment and relaxation, I need these physical earthly conditions. Right? So we've heard that quote. Ego says, uh, change these conditions and I'll find peace. And spirit says, choose peace. Seek ye the kingdom of heaven first and all shall be given to us. It's, that's the same thing of, of what I'm learning and what I'm sharing and what we're all learning. I think this learning is really heightened at this time with the North Node Uranus. This teaching of every experience of stress and anxiety and tension can point to our conditioning patterns of relating to life and who we think we are and what we think life is, or they can be the stepping stone to a deeper allowing and thus a greater capacity for grace and trust. That's the same thing as seeking the kingdom of heaven first. It says, I trust this moment. Isn't that where grace and beauty and art comes from? Like all beauty, all music, all art, all everything, it doesn't come from a purely um, an abiding, perfect state of peace, it comes through the meeting point of life not being what we wanted it to be and softening there. Like art, art is born from the tension um, between the truth of perfection and our resistance to that. And the, there's like, there's like a, a, a child of, of infinite expression is born from that, that just happens and then we can look at it we can dance it we can sing it um we can paint it we can cook it everything we can arrange the furniture in a room everything gets to be held that way and this is the prayer and the blessing that i am offering to us and then i'm going to shift a little bit into the astrology in a moment then i'll sing a song this is the prayer and the blessing that i'm offering for all of us during this time to abide in a deeper state of trust and allowing that actually the higher intelligence of Taurus is grace. And that's a, a deeper way of understanding 
what it means to live a meaningful life. That's what it means to live a life where we're content and happy. We all know that there are people that don't have a lot of means, that don't have a lot of money, right? people that live on the streets that are, some of them are happier than people with lots and lots of wealth. We know already that our material condition, that our anything human condition, our physical condition, our sensual condition, isn't actually what makes us happy. We know that the determinant for happy is actually in the mind, is in our relationship to the moment. And this is what we're all learning, and this is the prayer and the blessing for us, that we can apply this learning in our lives. And there's a greater capacity. So Uranus is where we observe. We take a step back <clears throat> from the seeming immediacy of the literalness of everything that seems to be manifesting in our lives. We step back and we observe everything as if we're apart from it, meaning we say, this isn't touching me. I'm feeling but I'm also watching. And thus there's a watcher and there's the sensations arising. But if I'm watching the sensations, it, it, Uranus just points to that truth that our consciousness is eternal, it's pure, it's whole, and it's not inherently by its very nature defined by the coming and going of experience. And in the higher intelligence of Taurus and that grace, we can actually settle into a place of witnessing and watching. And we can see with greater vision, you're honest, that bird's eye view, or getting on top of the stadium and seeing the drama of the life playing out, we begin to see the patterns, the archetypal patterns emerging. This is the algorithm of life organizing itself on its own. The less stressed we are, the more we are allowing and the less we interfere, the more we witness that there's a natural unfolding and rhythm to life unfolding on its own, where all things are coming together in harmony and resonance according to its nature. And it has nothing to do with our thoughts about it or our preferences about it either. The state of belonging and inclusivity that's arising and coming together is so perfect and beautiful, but it's just beyond our grasp. It's just beyond our conditioning. It's entirely beyond our grasp. It's entirely beyond our conditioning. And, and actually, okay, some self-compassion, that must be why anxiety and stress can be so common at, at, at a moment like this. Because there's an emergence of life and an unfolding that is actually calling forward a greater grace, a greater trust, because the intelligence of life is bringing everything together in a way that is even more relevant, more resonant, more in harmony with itself. And to come into a state of grace means we are going to face the very places where we are afraid of not having what we need. So the issue here with Taurus is, I know what I know and I have what I need. I remember when I, it's a random example, when I first got one of those smartphones, um, I got, um, you know, a different brand than the, the brand that I have now. And like a day or so into it, uh, someone broke into my car and stole my backpack and my phone. And I was really, you know, oh man, I, I just paid all this money for a phone. How, what a bummer. And I just came into an acceptance of it. And I was like, well, okay, let me buy, you know, I, I got an Android. I'm like, well, yeah, let me buy an Apple. And there is something, there's no punchline here, but there's something in this. Um, just in sort of like the open-mindedness to not be very attached to like the path that I was walking was kind of fun for me. Like, yeah, I lost money, whatever. But I was like, well, let's just try it again, but do it differently. Incidentally, the, the astrology app that I enjoy most is actually compatible with the Apple, not with the Android. Maybe that's changed since I've done this. So that was like, oh, cool. I'm kind of happy because that's one of my most highly used apps on my phone. I don't know if that was like why it happened. It's not for me to know that kind of thing. It's, I feel a little bit superficial, but there's something in that experience where I wasn't holding on too much of a story. I was open to the experience. And this is kind of what it's like to take life experience and be like, oh, that happened. All right, let's move forward from here. We can take gain and loss very lightly here because the, the, the influx of energy 
can be sudden and profound and immediate. In fact, it can be juxtaposed, intense anxiety, a sense of loss, insecurity, threat, everything is like unstable. And then like doors open, something new entirely. And maybe we just never thought we would go in that direction. Like, you know, I was going right and all these things happened. I'll just go left for the heck of it. Why not? There's something really powerful as well when it comes to Uranus in just going with the moment. Not planned, not logically understood. Uranus, Jeff Green teaches that Uranus corresponds to the higher mind. And, and this, this is literally just the intelligence of creation. It exists. That's why we can see like symbols and dream patterns and number patterns and sequences that we don't even know how to interpret. They're still going to manifest within our consciousness. These signals manifest regardless of our comprehension of them because they're archetypal, just like astrology exists, whether or not you even know your natal chart. You know, it's like these, the patterns are there. They're here to be studied. So that's where the Mercury and Jupiter signatures come in. You can see they're translating the higher mind impulses, the intelligence of creation. They're naming the patterns and then Jupiter is I, giving meaning, interpreting them. You dreamt of an elephant. What's the meaning? Google elephant. That's interpretation. So in a way, we don't even have to know what we're doing, but just to be the fool, that fool archetype just walking in the direction that we're walking why i don't know to know why is a little bit too much understanding so we're not even there yet but just to go and say well this feels interesting i don't know feels fun feels exciting i'm curious there's a an enjoyableness there is like a delightfulness that we can access. It's almost like that's even more intelligent than some sort of rational understanding or explanation. It allows something more intelligent than our current comprehension to actually unfold and teach us. And then the Mercury and Jupiter comes in and then it's like, oh, here's what's going on. And we can map it out and talk about it and write about it. So right now with Mars coming together with Uranus and the North Node, it does really speak to an, a, a profound period of liberation and awakening. And this is why the time right now is to just explore the truth of grace and peace and joy and relaxation in the context of all of our experiences. But it's helpful to understand with Mars involved right now at the time of this recording, Mars is about to come into alignment with these signatures. And then after this recording, probably around the time it's posted, Mars will begin separating by the 1st of August or so. That's where we're going to see ourselves you know right now we don't necessarily know the actions the steps and the specifics of everything it's like there's a new path unfolding we can't quite see it we can't bring our minds into the next few months this is where where mars comes into a new phase with the north and uranus we see okay now there's a new cycle we walk we make choices the self-leadership that we can meditate upon with Mars and Taurus right now as it's moving through this conjunction and beyond. What is it like to make conscious, clear, um, wise, thoughtful choices with respect to a state of relaxation and grace and trust? Mars is energetic. Mars is engaged. Mars is saying, I'm going to do this, right? But in Taurus, it's not anxious. It's, it's certain, it's confident, it's determined, it's moving, but it's also embodied. And there's something really enjoyable about that, really getting your hands dirty, engaging. This is what I want to work on. This is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. And to actually feel the joy of being in the body, the joy of connecting with something that feels enlivening, perhaps something new that we haven't done. It's not just literally about physical work or being in the body. It's this is the food I'm going to eat. This is the meal I'm going to prepare. These are the resources that I'm going to embrace and connect with in my own life. Interestingly enough, to understand that within Taurus, we tend to limit ourselves in our stress because we're holding on to a very narrow conception of the world. When we relax into a deeper state of trust and allowing, we don't have the answers, but that relaxation moves the energy. It allows us to feel, and that feeling allows the energy to move, and that always brings more insight. It always opens more possibilities. 
more options. Jeff Green spoke about the Taurus archetype as the frog in the well. From the point of view of the frog in the well, you're seeing a very small, narrow portion of the sky. If you get out of the well, you're going to feel anxious. Everything you know is in that well. Your whole world, everything that's secure and stable, but there might be stagnancy. It might not be working for you. So to get out of that well means leaning into the discomfort of life, but finding that there's actually a greater permission for grace and simultaneously possibilities and actions and choices and directions that we never would have thought of on our own had we not allowed ourselves to just be a little bit more gracefully uncomfortable. Okay. So I'll end this with a little song and then we'll open up the space for us just to share and connect with each other. singing in my home I am 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 home in my song home in my song. I am home in my song. I am home in my song. interpretation course begins. This is a deep study in the interpretive paradigm as taught by Jeffrey Wolf Green of Evolutionary Astrology. It's open only to those who have either studied with me in the part one essentials course or those who are already studied in the basics of evolutionary astrology. Learn more in the description below. To join, you have to fill out an application to make sure we are all on the same page. Thank you for watching.